I thought I would start with this. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook. I, I, I probably should have found a different way to, to do this, but I'll have to, I'll have to show it to you. And then uh, hopefully you'll get it. You can see it. It's a, uh, someone posted on face, face uh, book, what couples look like during the coronavirus. You probably have seen it. it's these two dogs that are, uh, so here. It's calm. I, on, I only share that to say, hopefully that's not where we're all at, but sometimes in close quarters, uh, you know, things can happen. So <laughs> we're gonna talk about uh, conflict resolution here this morning. And uh, I wanted to start to kind of preface everything and, and share, Dave Pachta on Sunday at his, on his sermon talked about this idea of teleos. And I really believe it's a, it's a profound, you know, concept to understand, especially, certainly as Christians, but as couples as well. And it, it really is this idea of coming to maturity, which he talked about. It's a progress over time. And teleos is where we get this, our word telescope. So to look on the horizon for something. And uh, when we're thinking about our relationship with God or thinking about our, our marriage relationships, sometimes we can have an unrealistic expectation that everything can change in a moment and can change instantly. And we've got to realize that teleos is about making small incremental changes. I, I call it changing and moving the needle. And so, you know, if kind of mathematics and trick and trajectory, if you make small changes and just change the slope a little bit over time, that gets, that's a, it's a greater change. And I share that to say, it's an important concept for us to appreciate about things that we want to change in our marriage, just moving the needle. And so when it comes to conflict resolution or dealing with things that are very challenging to us, I mean, any relationship has its conflict and has its difficulties. And, and so if we can just learn to put into practice a few things over time, we can make great changes in our marriage. So move the needle. And it's not about being perfect. Um, and it's not about just finding quick, easy solutions and a list of things that, that will just instantly bring change. It's about implementing small things that bring about uh, you know, change in our, in our relationship. And so we wanna split today's lesson into two uh, and, and cover a few points today and then some next week. And this, this lesson today starts really with ourselves. And I know in conflict, where do we look? Well, they did. He did. They, you know, they did this. And, and we often look at the other person. And I think God wants us to, first of all, look at ourselves. And so, first of all, when we think of restoring and reconciling relationships with one another, I mean, even what is happening, what are we thinking about this weekend is Easter. Think about what God has done to reconcile us to him. You know, when God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, there's this weird kind of dream that Abraham has. And, and it, it's this, this dream where the animals get cut in half and this fire pot and Abraham kind of wander through the middle of these carcasses. And we may not understand and appreciate that, but in Middle Eastern culture, they actually did this to, to confirm and fulfill a covenant. And so what they were saying is, as we walk through and make this covenant together with one another, and you're looking at the carcasses on both sides of you, you are saying, may it be done to me what is done to these animals if I violate this, this covenant pretty serious. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing that God actually does when he made that covenant with Abraham and ultimately with us 
He says, may that be done to me when you break this covenant. And so Easter is a reminder of how much God did, in fact, the fulfillment of Jesus' sacrifice for us when we broke the covenant with him. You know, God has gone to great lengths to forgive us. And, uh, you know, last week we were asked the question, uh, what is forgiveness? You know, it is, how do we define forgiveness? Is it based upon how I feel? Did they, for, you know, should I forgive them? Is it, is it proof of loyalty or is it commitment? How does God, first of all, define forgiveness? Romans 4 verse 7 says, Blessed are they whose sins are forgiven, whose sin the Lord never counts against him. Psalm 103 is some of our favorite psalm. You know, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. As far as from the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So if you have a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 12 to help kind of set up again. This is all introductory. But in, in view of God's mercy, I think I begin to be at a place where I can proper, properly resolve conflict in my marriage. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, all of what God has done for us, his grace, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, we, we all come to marriage with some background. Um, we come with some molds that have helped shape us who we are. Some good characteristics, some sinful characteristics. Some characteristics in, in nature, some of our natures are, we're fighters, you know, you, you run to the fight. You have conflict, and you will speak your mind. You will share your thoughts. You, you will, you know, you'll, you'll run to the fight. Others of, of us may flee and be flighters. We, we, we don't like the conflict. The emotional tension is, is, is difficult to bear. Fight or flight is not necessary. It's not sinful. It can lead to sinful patterns, but it's the way that we handle conflict. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, that has been, we've seen that in our parents, and so we've learned to, to deal with it that way. Some of it's in our, just in our innate character. There's other things that are sinful that the world has molded us, and perhaps, again, by family or by culture, by things we read or think of how we should resolve. We, we, have, we have been molded. And uh, we've always, we've got to fight that. We've got to allow God to define what is best and how we're shaped. And he'll go on to say, for the grace given to me, verse 3, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. You know, again, why am I spending so much time here? Because the grace of God, the cross, brings me to a sense of humility. And allows me to, to, it sobers me and allows me to be at a place where I can be and I can begin to resolve conflict. And so he'll go on to say, verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so... Again, we've got to take personal responsibility as far as it depends on us. And so we're going to talk about a few things here, uh, and hopefully we can get a chance to have some uh, you know, questions at the end of that. But uh, first of all, we've got to take the initiative. Uh, turn to Romans chapter, uh, not Romans, but Matthew chapter 5. 
Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 23 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You know, God wants us to take the initiative. And why is it so important? Why is reconciliation so important? Because we're fooling ourselves to think that we're righteous and we're holy and we have this right relationship with God when those closest to, to us were not reconciled with. To go to church with, un, you know, with, with, with unforgiveness and ask forgiveness from God, it's, it doesn't match up. And so it blocks our fellowship with God. God is serious about us taking responsibility. How can you have a relationship with me and still be so disunified and unreconciled and unforgiven with your spouse? And notice who does the initiating. And we've got to take the initiation. You know, in, in our early in our marriage, we may not even realize that we have done anything wrong. Um, I, and I speak to us as guys, we kind of get oblivious and then we're, we're getting a sense from, from our wives, there's, there's something we did and we maybe have honestly been oblivious to it. I didn't know that was important to you. I didn't know you cared about that. As you grow in your marriage, as you, there are times where I, I certainly know that I have done something. I can tell by her demeanor. I can tell by what she says or what she doesn't say, say. I can tell, as we say, there is a tension that you can cut with a knife. And now I have a choice. Do I initiate or do I not? And, uh, you know, it's hard. It's, it's hard to take the initiation. It's hard to start the dialogue. Um, and, but we've got to, you know, it's, it's hard again, because we have met, we, our character sometimes, if we're flighters and runners, we, we, we don't want to go there, but we, we've got to do it. And there's been times where just, I've been plain stubborn and I've, I've, I've actually kind of played a tape in my own mind and I've gone, well, I have, I have initiated reconciliation uh the last few times and you know keeping a record of wrongs perhaps or rights <laughs> and, and that you know what i'm not gonna do it this time i'm just not this she's gonna joyce is gonna step up and she's gonna humble herself well that may or may not happen and a wise old elder would would say to to us why go through kind of days unhappy? Why not be reconciled and kind of enjoy what God wants you to in, enjoy? Joyce is going to share some things here. He's stolen it all already. <laughs> um, no, I think it's important. We'll that, talk after. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important that we really understand what our character is as far as being a fighter, a flighter. I think uh, nowadays, there's another term that's been included, but basically fighting and flighting in and of themselves, they're not right or wrong. It's the consequences or the actions we take. Um, you know, our upbringing has played a lot into who we are by our nature and then just our own DNA. <clears throat> but um, it, we can fool ourselves by thinking that a fighter is more wrong or inaccurate, <clears throat> but True. we're actually fooling ourselves um, by thinking that flighting, running away from it, um, solves the problem. The problem's never been solved. There's no real reconciliation. Um, you've just been quiet. And so even though it's not a storm the way maybe another person might react, you still don't have true reconciliation. And um, I, I think, 
also it is important um you know in in our marriage by nature we both flee we're both flighters we're not the ones who would naturally fight and uh in other relationships you may have both fighters or you could have someone who fights and someone who flees um, but it's important i think especially if someone is more of the fighter initially is to be sensitive to the person who has the flight character um, i believe we have to try and create a safe environment uh, to be able to speak and i i do believe and i'm trying not to say this just as the woman but also in the whole idea of taking initiative if we both want to live our marriage in light of the gospel in light of god i would really encourage the brothers to take the lead in the initiation as far as just hey honey i know we need to talk when's a good time to talk even if you don't resolve it in the moment um I look at this as being protected by my husband, as Paul writes about in Ephesians 5, is it is a good opportunity to take the lead. Um, because I think as wives, a lot of times we want to throw that back at our husbands and go, well, you didn't lead or you're not leading. Um, but I think in resolving conflict, this is a perfect opportunity to just say, and it doesn't matter what our nature is, but um, let's resolve this, even if it's not today or not in this moment, but we're not going to bed angry or we're not, you know, walking away. I know I had to learn early in our marriage. I think we were, it was within the first year, um, probably at least six months or so married. I don't even know what it was over, but I was hurt about something and I went and slept on the couch and I was like, that was pretty lonely. Um, but I remember looking back on that. I don't know how we even talked about it ultimately, but I did say to myself, I will never do that again. Um, and I think there's things where we have to draw those lines that we say we won't do that again, that we're committed to reconciliation. And if it does mean I initiate first, there's many times where I will say, honey, can we talk about this at some point? Or can I ask you this whenever you're ready? Can we talk? Maybe it's not just a good time, um, you know, with work or whatever. Um, but anyway, just taking the uh, initiative in that and um, creating a safe place where whatever we express, um, that our thoughts and feelings are going to be um, embraced and that uh, we can go on, but we have to at least take the initiative in order to start reconciliation. Great, thank you. Um, again, it, it's, it's just hugely important for us to, to see what Jesus wants us to see in, in that we have this responsibility, each one of us, to kind of step up and begin the process of reconciliation. Why? Because as I've talked about, what is God's track record? Over and over and over, he has taken the initiative. That's the, the first point. Second one is confess my part of the conflict. And again, I realize this is, this is tough stuff. Uh, this, is, this is not easy. Again, I have, and we have probably, we can have lists of what, during a conflict, what the other person has done. And it's so easy to look at them versus looking at yourself. <clears throat> and in uh, Matthew chapter seven, verse three, it says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye or wife or husband's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your wife or husband, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, again, this is not easy. Because what we see, we see the, the, the faults, the sins of the other person uh, of greater consequence or of greater significance than we see our own. 
And I think God wants us to, to in, in order to reconcile, we've got to stop. We've got to stop kind of going there and we've got to look at ourselves. And again, I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying that this is easy. This is very difficult to first of all, look in the mirror at yourself. But what God wants us to do, and this is the idea, when we, when we confess my part, confession has to do, and the, 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 the word is hamalageo. It means to say the same thing as. So when, when we confess our sins to God, we say the same things and we have the same viewpoint, the same mindset that God has of our sin. We come in agreement with what God feels about it. And, and so that, it, that's significant. We don't gloss it over. We don't minimize it. When we confess to God, we are recognizing that we see it the same way that God does. God does. Now, of course, we don't because we don't have the same clarity, but we're attempting to, with humility, put ourselves at a place before God to say, this is how I've fallen short restore my relationship back with you. That's what confession is to God. And so when I confess and when I begin to look in the mirror, I need to take responsibility for the things that I have done. And again, it requires some guts. It requires some courage and bravery, but I must say the same thing. Uh, not have earthly interpretations, not water it down. Well, you know, you drove me to this. And, and if you got angry, I'm sorry, I got angry. If, if you uh, were selfish, I'm sorry, I was selfish. Uh, you, you've got to say the same thing, angry or, you know, impatient. I did not consider you, again, speaking of Ephesians chapter 5, this idea of um, a husband's responsibility to, to nourish and, and to, to help present their wives holy and blameless and radiant. And many of the, the, the conflicts or fights that, that Joyce and I have had over time is my failure to present her that way. My Failure to love her as Christ loved. And, and so when, I, when I, I know there's conflict or I sense there's conflict, I've got to look at, okay, what have I done? Or what am I not doing to present her? Have I not considered her? Have I not focused on her? Have I not led her spiritually and guided her? And those lead to conflicts, and I must take responsibility for that. You know, honey, you share that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think what makes it easier in trying to understand um, where you confess your own part is if I were talking to God and God would say, Joyce, you're being um, impatient or you're being critical or you're nagging, what biblical term would God give it? And I think that's that's a more poignant way of and, and understanding what confession is, is that I agree with what God would call it. If God says selfishness is not right, then I have to be willing to say I was selfish and now my confession agrees with God. Um, I think in trying to consider, especially for us as women, sometimes um, asking ourselves too, in, in trying to understand where is this coming from, why am I thinking or feeling this, is also perhaps asking ourselves, am I being realistic? Um, because sometimes we have unrealistic and then unfortunately they're unspoken expectations. And so um, yeah. as we were talking earlier with, with some of us uh, before we started, you know, we might be cleaning our basement or doing other chores um, around the house because we have extra time. And we may be thinking, oh, he should do this or he should do that or why doesn't he? And all along, we've never expressed any of it. And then three days later, we're irritated about something, but it's because we had this either unspoken or unrealistic expectation. 
And I think sometimes trying to understand and, and take us back to agreement with God in our confession is, is trying to step outside ourselves. And that does take humility, as Sean is saying, to step outside and get God's perspective. Um, because if there's disunity, there is disunity. And so we have to look at ourselves and go, in agreement, we have to talk and I say, this is what I did and I bring it to the table. He says, this is what I did and he brings it to the table. Um, and I think, you know, if we get into the pattern of just wanting to be right or wanting to win, right. we never get to the goal of reconciliation. Right. Uh, if, if we walk away from, say, an argument, an interaction, and then we just feel like, yes, I won. Actually, nobody won exactly because we never really got to true resolution and we're not reconciled the way Jesus would, you know, describe reconciliation. And so the goal is not winning an argument. The goal is reconciliation. And um, when we take the initiative and we confess our part, we're going to get to um, true reconciliation a whole lot quicker. And it is that idea, I'd rather be happy. I can, um, I can go, woohoo, I won and put a trophy, right. you know, on a shelf. But you know what, I'm not gonna stare at that for the rest of, you know, the day and the weeks to come. I'd rather be happy for the day and the weeks to come in a reconciled relationship. So winning is not um, obviously the goal, it's just arriving to reconciliation. But we have to have the humility to go, um, this is my part, that I'm in agreement with God and I take initiative to confess that. You know, I, I, it's, I want to build a place in my marriage, in my home, that is this refuge. I mean, of all the places that I want some safety and I want some comfort and I want some happiness and joy and, and meaning, it's, it's, in, it's in, in my home and in my marriage. Um, even getting to the next point, the, the world is tough. The world is, is hard. It's, it's, it's difficult. And we're, we're barraged with all sorts of things and it can be painful. And, uh, but I don't, I don't want that to continue. I want to kind of put the world behind me and come home and find this place of, of, of comfort and strength. And so it, it, to take responsibility and confess our part is, is really building the home that God wants us to have and really we want to have. And if we don't remove the, the beams, we're always, we're, well, you can't see, so you really can't build, but you, you're building something. If you're not taking the beams out of your own eye, you're building walls between you and your spouse. Mm -hmm. To take those beams away, you begin to, to build something that is what God wants and a foundation that, that really can help provide the relationship that God wants you to have. And so we've got to not only take initiative and confess our part. Lastly, we've got to listen for the hurt. James 1 verse 19 says, you know, everyone's got to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. You've probably heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. And we all experience pain. I mean, again, life is tough and past experiences and whether they be even from those closest to us, we've experienced pain and trauma and hurt and conflict. And, and, and all we know how to do in our relationship now is to respond in kind or similarly. And out of our pain and out of our, our, our hurt, we, we lash back because we were a fighter or we lash back because it's the last straw. It's the, I, I've been hurt and, and all of a sudden, you know, something happens and I, and I lash out. And so listening is much more than simply a verbal skill. I mean, a, you know, listening, an audible skill. It, it, it is about stopping and focusing and changing our attention. Again, it's more than an auditory thing. It's, it's observing nonverbal 
and demeanor. And when Jesus says he who has ears, let him hear, he's not just talking about, did you, did you get it with your ears? No, did you get it with your heart? Are we tuned in to, to, to see one another? We've got to take it deeper. We've got to be moved with empathy and compassion. And again, <laughs> I, I, I'm the first to say this is, not, this is not easy. This is difficult. Again, when we are hurt, to try to attempt to remove myself and to feel compassion for the other person it, it, it almost seems impossible. But God, God wants us to, to kind of shift that attention, to, 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 to think of how Jesus was moved by, by hurt and pain around, you know, as, as he did his ministry. To bring re reconciliation, resolution, we must listen with empathy and compassion. And I shared this before, I, you know, to, to love as Christ loved, to present my wife radiant, you know, I, I've, I've got to listen to her. And our conflicts that we have often come from the fact that I've not listened. And again, it's much more than just auditory. It's have I been, have I been the husband that I've needed to be to love as Christ loved? Man, pressures, worries, conflicts. I mean, I'm not oblivious to what we're all kind of feeling, thinking experiencing uh, what's bouncing around in our in our brains and heads and hearts over the last month and maybe months ahead I don't know that, that the difficulty with what we're all going through right now is how long will this continue <laughs> I don't know so there's a lot of things we feel and even in this moment I shared the funny video at the beginning you know the dogs kind of maybe all it takes is, is something your spouse does and boom, you, you know, you react, but it's out of pain. It's out of hurt. It's out of anxiety. It's out of worry. It's out of a lot of different things. And are we, can we even put ourselves in someone else's shoes? And, and so to carry each other's burdens, to realize that it's okay to feel some hurt, but can we help each other? Um, yeah, I was just going to share, I heard um, this statistic a couple weeks ago, so, uh, you know, after the social distancing had started, and um, this stat comes from the US, um, I'm sure it's not limited to there. So we've, you know, been more a month now into it, but in the first couple weeks, there was an upkick in um, domestic violence, and it had grown by 30%. Um, during that the first two weeks and then also um, I think alcohol sales had gone up 50% well that doesn't work well either um, but you know I, I share that to say you know God forbid that in our time of even being um, you know sequestered in our home that it would be a great opportunity to seek to understand to learn to listen to the hurt versus having, you know, our children witness domestic violence and, um, you know, alcoholism that would lead to that. Um, you know, this is a great time for us to, to work on one thing, you know, pick one thing, um, you know, but to shine in that. But if I have, if I have the desire um, to be understood, then I have to also have the desire to understand. And that is right. entering each other's place of hurt and listening for the hurt. Sometimes, um, you know, the hurt is not spoken. And, you know, when I was sharing, Sean and I can both by nature flee. Um, we laugh now, but it was probably one of the longest silent fights we ever had <laughs> was a drive to Canada from Virginia Beach. And- um, That's 12 hours. Of... It was not the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> but felt like it. <laughs> it felt like it. Um, at least five or six hours, honestly, of probably silence. But it all that's, had that's painful. <laughs> <laughs> but it all had to do with I had shared some tension I was feeling in the speed that Sean was driving. And um, and honestly, the concern was more 
in applying for um, immigration status even back then is you want as clear a record as possible and everything is examined. And, um, and so what I wanted him to hear was, please don't cause us to get a ticket. Um, but without any kind of response, he probably slowed down for a minute or two. <laughs> But it was more as I saw the needle go above what I thought the expectation shouldn't be any higher. Um, it was just unspoken and unresolved for a long time. But, you know, we look at that and go, how do we just overcome that? How can we initiate that? How can we seek to be understood? Um, you know, I, I don't want us to get a ticket and have to pay for that. But the true motive was I don't want it because it could impact immigration. And, you know, I think it does take a lot for us to be able to want to understand. And I think, you know, that listening is, is um, when, when the Bible tells us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we have to listen to him through his word the same way. And so I, you know, I, I share that from the perspective of you know, am I more interested in defending myself and why I did it and, and right. you know, or why I said that or why I, you know, screamed, whatever I did, is it wanting to defend it or find a friend to validate my point of view as to be understood? And so if I want to be understood, I have to be able to also listen with the same desire with my heart, with my mind with all of my being to understand where is Sean coming from? Where am I coming from? Where can we meet that God is present? So anyway, that's my take on that. Yeah. I mean, obviously during that, that time it was uncomfortable, but I had to with humility reflect on what I had done. Um, and I was not <laughs> considerate. Of course, to, in my thinking, it was, I'm not going to get a ticket. <laughs> I'm, I'm careful driver. It was, it was, she, it was not, she shouldn't have thought that way. Um, but again, I was not, I was not considerate and I was not thoughtful to what she was feeling. And again, I say it, it yeah, may have been six, seven hours, but it was a painful six, seven hours. That's, I don't like that. Um, and so I, I've just, I've learned, okay, these, those moments to me are kind of emblazoned in my memory. And so do I want to do that again? Mm -hmm. Do I want to live there? Why, why would I want that? Let's, let's, let's work this out. And again, it all starts with us. And I think today it's just making sure we start with ourselves. I wish conflict resolution was we could give you kind of five easy steps and it would be done and you would just have perfect marriages and we could resolve things just absolutely in a, in a moment's time. But relationships are a dynamic. And it's like I said, it's also this idea we, that they need to be worked at. Teleos, they need to mature. We need to move needles in our relationships to, to help them change. I, I don't become, I, I may follow a, an, athlete's regimen of fitness and maybe I can perform that that exercise routine the way that they would that doesn't make me an athlete of that potential all of a sudden I probably may never get there but it's the same thing in our marriages or relationships just by doing a few things does not make us instantly conflict resolvers We've got to continue to work at it. Press on toward the goal. That's this idea of maturity. And so this morning is to remind us of a few things, to move the needles, to make sure but we're focusing on ourselves. Small changes that, will con that can change the trajectory of our marriage. And uh, so next week we'll have, we'll, we'll talk, kind of build upon even that some more but anyone have any thoughts or comments uh, before we uh, kind of close out anyone questions 